Hello, everyone. Good evening. Can you all hear me okay? Yes, excellent. Well, my name is Margie Cook. I'm part of the team that brings you live from NYPL. And I want to say hello to everyone who is watching right now, those of you in this room and those of you watching online. I'm so pleased um, to be here and to introduce Vahini Vera, writer, journalist, Pulitzer Prize finalist in fiction, and now short story author of This is Salvaged, who is here tonight in conversation with New York Times bestselling author Leslie Jameson, and we're so lucky to have them both with us tonight. And you can find their full bios in your printed program or on the event listing on the website. So named by multiple outlets as one of the most anticipated books of the year, This is Salvaged is a collection of short stories united by the question, in a world defined by estrangement, where is communion to be found? Child, parent, friend, sibling, neighbor, lover. In these tales, Vahini captures how we search for meaning through one another. Her book is available for purchase for those of you in this room and through our online shop for those of you attending virtually. Whichever way you purchase it, and please do if you are able, proceeds go to benefit the New York Public Library. And for those of you here tonight, there will be a signing after the event. And for you online folks, if you need a link to purchase, we'll put it in the chat right now if we haven't already. Um, oh, and of course, if you have a New York Public Library card, you can borrow the book for free. Um, so before I turn it over, I have a few upcoming events I'd like to tell you about in the days and weeks ahead. Tomorrow, we're joined by Benjamin Balint in conversation with Joshua Cohen. Balint's new book is a gripping new biography of the Polish Jewish writer Bruno Schulz and an account of the secret operation to rescue his lost artworks. On October 24th, please join us and see Pam Zhang, who will discuss her new book, Land of Milk and Honey, with Padma Lakshmi. Um, you won't want to miss this. It has it all. Climate disaster, culinary delights, and a woolly mammoth even makes an appearance. So... And on Friday, October 27th, which is our favorite time of the year because it's the annual Halloween costume parade with Tim Gunn and your public library librarians. So that returns and join us across the street for drinks, crafts, the parade, and more. And if you can't get enough of Tim, because we can't apparently, the week after, he'll be back to interview Mary Beard about Roman emperors, her follow-up to the worldwide best-selling SPQR. And you can pre-order that as part of your registration. So be sure to register at nypl.org slash live. We hope to see you there. And you may have noticed, uh, tucked into your programs or index cards, please use those cards for writing questions. You'll see a member of our staff come around and collect those later in the program. Live from NYPL is made possible by the continuing generosity of Celeste Bartos, Manaz Ispahani Bartos, and Adam Bartos. And of course, by all of you, our wonderful supporters and friends near and far, Thank you for the support, and thank you again for being here. And with that, I'll turn it over to tonight's guests. Hi, Wahine. Hi, Leslie. It's so fun to be here celebrating you and this beautiful book, which you already know I am obsessed with, but it's so fun to be able to sit up here and ask you some questions about it, too. Oh, me too. I'm so excited to, yeah. to be here with you. Yeah. Welcome, everybody. Thanks. Yeah. Um, and you might start off by reading a little bit for us. Yes. Yeah, yeah I would wonderful. be happy to. Um, it's so nice to see all of you. I want to sort of like go one by one and be like, hi, Dana. <laughs> hi, everybody. But I'm not going to do that. <laughs> um uh, it's so nice seeing all your faces. I'm really honored and happy to be here at the library with Leslie. Um, so I'm going to read from a story called I Buffalo. And all you need to know before I start is that um, this is a story about a woman who has sort of had a fall from grace. Um, she drinks too much. She just lost her job after a kind of scandal involving... Um, drugs and sexual impropriety. It was really messy and bad. Um, and now um, she has hum come home from a sort of confusing day where she was drinking too much and doesn't really remember what happened. All she remembers is that she vomited somewhere in her house and she doesn't know where it is. Um, and 
Um, and now her sister has called and sorry, this is a really long setup. Her sister has called and I could just like describe the story for you. I don't have to read. Um, her sister has called and is like, guess what? I'm driving into town. Um, my daughter, your niece has, who is a child actor, um, has an audition in San Francisco. So we're going to be there in like a minute. So now they're there and, um, there's a smell in the house. Okay. Mar and Mara is the name of her niece. Mara came across as very comfortable in her skin, the way child actors often do. You want to know something interesting, she said. What? The Donners ate each other. You know them? The Donner party? I was taken aback. I hadn't remembered her being this gruesome. By the time I thought of what to say, not personally, I wanted to say, to be a little funny, Mara had moved on. She was wandering around the room, occasionally asking a question. Who's this? Or pointing the remote control at the TV. How does this work? She moved really fast. I couldn't keep up. Sheila, she said, after some time. Yeah. What's that smell, she said. I froze and then recovered. What smell, I said. Must be your upper lip. Over dinner, they explained that Mara's audition was for a film about the Oregon Trail. Mara had been doing her, her research to get into character, getting Priya to take her to the local library and search the catalog. That was how she had discovered the story of the Donners, who had eaten each other. I wouldn't eat you, I said to Mara, unless I was really hungry. Dude, Priya said. I chewed on a pizza crust, took a swig of beer, and grabbed another slice. I had fled Mara's question about the smell by giving my flippant answer, then running to the kitchen to put the pizzas in the oven. Now all seemed nice again. We'll go see the buffaloes tomorrow, I thought. These are the, the bison that are in Golden Gate Park. We'll go see the buffalo tomorrow, I thought. Maybe tomorrow the others will be out. I would say to Mara, did you know that the American bison is the largest mammal in North America? Technically, they're bison. At one point, there were 60 million of them in the United States alone. That was before the United States existed. Then white people showed up and hunted them so bad that there were only a couple hundred of them left. They were about to go completely extinct, so some environmentalists got together and decided to save them. They put a bunch of them in Golden Gate Park and maybe some other places, too. And all these bison had babies, and now they're not even close to going extinct. All this was true. I'd been surprised by this information, which I'd found on a big faded tablet in the park. Do you know what extinct means, Priya? asked Mara. It's when every single animal of one kind of animal dies, Mara said. Right, Priya said. Like the Donner Party, Mara said, and grinned. <laughs> oh, God, Priya moaned. Sam. I mean, not exactly, Mara, Sam said. Humans won't be extinct until we're all dead. He turned to me. She does this great cannibalism routine. He took a giant bite of his pizza and chewed with his mouth slightly open. A little cheese sprayed from between his teeth. Nom, 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 he said. And when he finished, he patted his stomach. I laughed. He had grown one of those soft domestic paunches. My own lost man had one of those. A place to cup your hand at night. A place consistent with the truth, if ever there was such a place. My God, I had gotten so close. Method acting, he said. This other man, Priya's man, said it. Don't make fun of me, Mara shouted, dropping her pizza onto her plate. It seemed she might cry, but then she started laughing shyly. Don't mess around, you guys, Priya said. Sheila, Sheila, this gruesomeness of hers, it's actually freaking me out. How long until it isn't a phase, until it isn't a phase anymore? At first, I felt a surge of pride that my sister would still confide in me after all that had happened between us. The truth was this. I'd been a bad big sister, full of spite. I would persuade poor Priya to watch as I stretched a live worm with my fingers until the creature snapped in two or allowed a mosquito to rest on my thigh and fill itself, and filled, fill itself up with my blood before thwacking my palm onto it and smearing the resulting reddish gunk across Priya's shirt. But our parents had ignored this in light of my excellence at school and at piano, les piano lessons and had focused on berating Priya for her learning difficulties and clumsy musical efforts. But then I recognized what was happening. She must have been waiting to find me in a moment of weakness. Here was that moment, and here was her chess move. How long until it isn't a phase anymore? The implication being that there was a direct line between my old childhood badness and my recent fall from grace. Um, sorry, I'm reading more. I just, I'm skipping a part. Um, None of us spoke. We bent our heads over our pizzas. We munched our crusts from end to end. We pinched our fingers. We pinched between our fingers the bits of sausage and pepper that had fallen to our plates and ate those too. Sam sighed and went to the fridge for a second beer. Priya burped. Oh God, she said, I'm tipsy. 
Are you kidding? I said, you're not drunk. I hated those women who would have two drinks and claim to be wasted. Oh, my delicate constitution. I couldn't believe my little sister had turned into one of them. She used to be fun. She used to be able to keep up with me. Our parents worried more about her than about me. No matter how much she studied, she couldn't do better than a B average. No matter how much she practiced piano, she couldn't progress. And now you looked her up online and she had this slick social media presence. She had once been an up and coming journalist, but she left that when Mara was born. Now she made YouTube videos a bit about being a stage mom or whatever you call it. She got invited to write guest posts on parenting blogs. Meanwhile, an online search for my name turned up lurid articles in the legal press. I held out hope that other more prominent people with my name would soon overtake me on Google. <laughs> Most of them were unlikely candidates, a self-published poet in Virginia, a teacher in Detroit, but some seemed promising. I had my eye on the marketing vice president at Procter & Gamble, who, according to LinkedIn, had been slowly moving up the managerial chain. I prayed for the rise of that other, better Sheila. <laughs> now Mara spoke again. Sheila, seriously, what is that smell? Priya and Sam turned to look at me, and I stood to clear the table, making a noisy pile of the plates and then going to the sink to slide the scraps into the garbage disposal. I could feel pinpricks under my arms, and I wondered if I was visibly sweating. What? I called out from the sink. But even as I spoke, I knew I sounded stupid. I had to confess. The smell, I called, still standing there. Then I returned to the dining table and added, like it was nothing. I threw up somewhere. Oh, Sheil, Priya said. I didn't know which was worse, her passive aggression minutes ago or her pity now. I don't know where it is, I said, feeling smaller than the smallest person ever to have existed. It's weird. There was silence. Then Sam said, that's okay. He grinned. That's okay, Sheila. It happens to everyone. <laughs> Priya opened her mouth as if to protest. It does not happen to everyone. But Sam had already scraped back his chair and rolled up his sleeves. We'll help you, he said. I wandered around the kitchen. Priya was drawn to the laundry room. Mara went upstairs by herself. Soon she cried out, cried out, found it. We went scrambling up the stairs to where she stood, peering down into the laundry chute, that dark limbo space of the house. Mara, move it, Priya cried out. This was dirty business, grown-ups only. Mara stepped back at the sharpness of her mother's tone, and the rest of us crowded around the laundry chute to see. Mara was right. The vomit had dried mid-drip along one side of the chute, into a purplish-brown crust of yellowtail, tuna, and fish eggs, decorated with... My, my friend from home told me not to read this. I'm sorry. <laughs> decorated with rice globules and see... I, Leslie said it was okay. I was like, oh should, I, should I not? She was like, no, you should. Please. Decorated with rice globules and seaweed bits. Of course Mara was the one to find it, Sam said. Your sense of smell hits its peak when you turn eight and declines when you hit your 20s. How Sam loved to make perfect sense out of everything strange and mysterious mm. in the world. He looked at Mara, who, after her mother's rebuke, stood quietly to the side. He touched her shoulder and said, the first step is to clean what we can reach from up here. He held the laundry chute open and peered inside. Sheila, he said, do you have a sponge? I went down to the kitchen and got the dish sponge from next to the sink, then returned and handed it to Sam. Sam, let her do it, for, let her do it herself, Priya said. For fuck's sake, Mara, stay back. Oh, let me try, Sam said, and he gave Priya a look that was compassionate and trite. Your big sister is in trouble. We must put aside our disgust and try to help. <laughs> Scrubbing with a dish sponge, he loosened and cleaned the crust around the top edges of the chute, and the fish smell tangled with the lavender smell of the detergent. But the vomit had dripped deep into the chute. Sam couldn't reach far enough to get all of it. I'll try, Priya said, avoiding my eyes. She took the sponge from Sam and stuck her arm into the chute, twisting at the waist to reach as far as she could. Her shirt lifted as she stretched, and I could see the light down of hair at the small of her back. Sam touched it. How bourgeois, I thought, for a husband to be tender toward his wife. I can't get it, Priya said. My turn, I said, but I couldn't reach either. The problem was that the space was too small for us. We were stymied at the shoulder. Priya had the idea to go downstairs to the laundry room and try to reach the vomit from below, and she took Sam with her to investigate while I stayed upstairs. Soon I heard her voice bellowing up through the chute. All they could see were some drops of puke atop my towels in the laundry basket. It's too far, Priya cried. It's all, sorry, Priya called. It's all up there. From the top of the chute, I could see her poking a broomstick around. It made a hollow <laughs> rattle. Mara crept closer, her eyes a glint. Was she thinking what I was thinking? I bent to her and waited for her to say it. I could try, she whispered. You want to? I whispered. I can, she whispered. She touched her mouth. Shush, they'll hear. Let's get you in there. I handed the dish sponge to her. 
what I did was I ho- hoisted her up by the waist and let her shimmy into the chute. I held her by the thighs, then by the ankles. Go at it, sweet pea, I said. Only then, when I had her by the ankles, all of her weight in my hands, did I remember how heavy she had become. A full-grown child. I felt it in my forearms. I felt it in my back. I fully, fully stand behind my opinion. (laughs) That was an amazing part of that story to hear out loud. Not only because I love that story so much and but because when you told me you were thinking about reading from it I I was I was like oh my god I have 16 questions that are just about that story so it's the perfect place to begin um yeah I mean I think one thing that I love about the premise of that story when you were saying oh I've been describing it for so long I was thinking anybody who doesn't want to read that story after your synopsis like doesn't have a (laughs) pulse you know what I mean like of course you want to read that story um I think there's something about this quest to find this hidden mess, you know, this like this this thing that stinks, but you can't quite put your finger on locating it. But it also is like ultimately undeniable, like mm-hmm. you can't ignore it forever. That feels like it concretizes or externalizes or dramatizes something about how shame feels. That it's like right there, and there's no getting away from it. But you can't quite touch it, and you can't quite clean it. Yeah. Um, and I, one of the things that I wanted to ask you about was kind of how you, whether you're conscious of a desire to write into sources of shame or the experience of shame, um, what that looks like for you and how you think about approaching that dimension of like the experience of being alive and, and also maybe what the connection is between shame and intimacy. Because ultimately this yeah. becomes a kind of collective experience of a very private moment of yeah. shame. Yeah, no, I mean, I think, I don't think that I explicitly think of myself as someone who's interested in writing about shame. That said, I think I always, as a reader, I'm always drawn, we were talking about this earlier, um, I'm always drawn to like writing that says something about like the way it is to be human that like we don't necessarily always talk about. And I do think that the experience of shame, like by its very nature, right, mm-hmm. shame is something that like we don't often talk about out loud Mm because that's the point, right? That's Mm -hmm. the point of shame is that it's something like Mm -hmm. these are things that like are really closely held that we don't want to express. And so I think that's what compelled me to put it on the page. And yeah, I mean, I don't know that I was thinking about this other aspect, the aspect about intimacy explicitly while I was writing, but like rereading that scene Mm -hmm. um, and like rereading it as I was editing that scene too, I recognized in a way that I didn't necessarily recognize as I was writing it, like the way in which there's something like simultaneous, simultaneously like extra shameful about the way in which like reaching this vomit becomes a family effort Mm -hmm. and at the same time, somehow tender. Right. And I think that's an intersection that like, I definitely, I'm probably like, I'm explicitly interested in that intersection. Mm -hmm. Like the way in which like, like, there's a kind of closeness that can simultaneously be like a desirable closeness and like a closeness that Mm -hmm. you want to push away. Mm -hmm. And I think that like that moment that I was reading about, like definitely Mm -hmm. is interested in that. Mm -hmm. I think I'm thinking about a moment earlier in the story when, um, the main character is, is thinking and talking about like the lost man with the the paunch and, or her, her kind of broken engagement and her former fiance. And, she says, you know, he'd, he was the person who had most fully seen me in this world and he wanted to spend his life with me. Like, of course I wanted to run away, yeah. you know, which feels like another um, way of getting at that intersection, right? That there's something tender and close about one's most shameful or private parts being seen, but also something terrifying yeah. and claustrophobic about right. that kind of intimacy. Um, and I was thinking as you were describing you know, that this whole story takes place kind of in the shadow of a few major life ruptures for this character. Mm. Like she's lost her job. She's, um, her engagement has been broken and it was making me think about, I actually really love um, the top, um, the blurb on the back of your, this like beautiful quote from Danielle Evans. Um, and she says, sometimes I think in their best 
iterations. Blurbs are small pieces of literary criticism yes. in this beautiful way. And she says this is salvage is as interested in the aftermath of a breaking point as the break itself. Um, and certainly I Buffalo feels like an instance of like writing into the aftermath of a few different breaking points. And I was curious, like what, um, again, maybe one part of the question is like, is that a conscious gravitational force that you feel yourself pulls towards like the aftermath mm -hmm. of events and uh, whether it's grief in the aftermath of loss or this kind of muddling through in the aftermath of some great kind of breaking point. Um, but I'm curious what is interesting to you about those aftermath spaces, like not the high wattage narrative event, but kind of the, the morning after. Yeah, I mean, that too is, is something that I, I think usually my answers to questions like that start with, I wasn't conscious of it while, I don't know if it's the same for you, Leslie, when you're writing, but I wasn't conscious while I was writing it. But I think like in the revision process um, and also just looking back on these stories when I'm done with them, it occurs to me that, um, that like I am really interested in like figuring out language for the kind of inexplicable or... You know, like we've all had these moments, whether it's like after the loss of a, of a person, right? Like after the death of a loved one or after another kind of rupture or loss, like that way in which like you're sort of like, you feel like you've sort of been like dynamited to bits and like can't even understand, mm -hmm. like the, you're sort of at a loss for language, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's where that kind of cliche, right? About like being at a loss for words coming comes from. Um and I think as a writer, as somebody who like is so interested in like figuring out how to articulate what's happening, I think like that space, like th those moments after the, mm -hmm. after the big thing mm -hmm. where like, where that's the feeling, like feel really interesting to me to excavate. Like it feels like a challenge, I think, to be like, okay, well how, like, what are the words one would come up with mm -hmm. to try to describe this? Mm -hmm. How do you do that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. I love that idea of kind of writing into those spaces of experience that like make us feel as if we're at a loss for words. And yes, of course, like the kind of call or compulsion or futile like hurling of oneself against the impossibleness for a writer is like, how do we find language for yeah. them? And, and maybe, yeah, there's also a way in which in the midst of drama or chaos or everything falling apart the catastrophe can sometimes feel like its own sort of company like it's mm. you're you're in the midst of it and it's almost like the way that you get sick like when you go home for break or something like that like when things calm down is like when there's actually the the maybe the impact fully yeah. descends and so it also makes sense that trying to find to dwell in that space and find language for all that kind of like okay the noise has died down and yeah. now, now what what next what um, happens now yeah, right yeah. yeah um it's interesting as you were reading it out loud and you got to the part where you're fully describing the vomit and that was when you were like my friend told me <laughs> should I read this part out loud um but of course like one of the things that I love about this collection is its attention to the body to like sensory experience, embodied experience, and maybe especially those parts of embodied experience that most make us feel like, oh, is it okay to say this out mm -hmm. loud? Can I say this? Can I describe this? Which is to me where like the heat and the truth live. And early on, one of your characters says to another, like, I don't think we talk enough about labial sweat. And the other character's like, well, do you want to talk about it? You know, she's being very nice. She's like, do you want to talk about it? But there are all sorts of moments of like, there's a moment of, um, two characters encountering each other in a in a bathroom stall after she's just finished peeing or another moment when you say like men don't understand the feeling of intimacy a woman feels when she walks into a bathroom stall and there's like the yeasty smell of the woman who's been there before and i i think my question is about sort of both how do those moments of just like bodily texture and often like kind of like what we might call like gross bodily texture mm -hmm. like how do they make their way into the writing and then either as you're writing or maybe like looking at it in the, as, as you see what you've made, what, what work do you see those moments of kind of like grossness doing or fluids or, or bodies? Like, yeah, yeah. What, what do they bring? So it's so weird because that, like more than anything else that I've recognized or like friends or others who've read the collection have recognized a book about the book that like took me by surprise more than anything else 
like this thing about bodily stuff was like news to me. Yeah. <laughs> um, and the first like full length review of the book that came out was um, uh, pub- was written by a Paraplus fellow. I know there's some Paraplus fellows here. It was written by a Paraplus fellow named Hannah Rivers at High Country News. And the headline was something like the gross in this, <laughs> color, right? Like, and the whole review was about grossness. And my mom read it and was like, I didn't like that review. It makes your sound, your book sound like very repulsive. <laughs> um, and I read it and was like, I was like, oh, this is so interesting. Mm-hmm. I didn't know mm-hmm. this about the book, right? Mm-hmm. Like, I thought it was such a smart, like you were saying, right, about, um, y- you know, but I, and I felt that way about this blurb from Danielle, by the way, also, like the way in which, like, it teaches you something about mm-hmm. your own work. Mm-hmm. Um, so I started thinking about that more after reading that review and, yeah. like, sort of, hearing other people talk about the grossness in this book. It also occurred to me when I was like starting to read for publicly from the book and was looking for things to read from and was like, Oh, well I can't read that. I can't read that. I can't, you know? And then <laughs> yeah. I was like, all right, I guess, I guess it's true. Um, I, th- <laughs> I think, um, I think be- the book is a lot about these stories are a lot about um, people in their sort of like most, like these moments where their sense, I think especially their sense of like their sense of identity, but their sense of identity as connected to other people is like sort of fractured or threatened. Mm -hmm, Right. mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, So there are a couple of ways I think in which like bodily things enter into it. One of which is like, I think on a symbolic level, there's a way in which like our hairs and like dry skin that slough off and you know, like our fluids that come out of us are like, I think they like serve this interesting symbolic function of like making explicit the way in which like our borders are not, Mm -hmm. are not finite or Mm -hmm. or not are Mm -hmm. porous. Right. Mm -hmm. That's the word I was looking for. Mm -hmm. Are are porous. Um, And like, there is this, like there isn't um, a sort of like strict boundary between Mm -hmm. ourselves and like those around us. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, And because the book is so much about like, kind of communal identity and it's fracturing as well mm-hmm. as sort of like individual identity or situates individual identity mm-hmm. within communal identity. I think like there was a lot of richness there for mm-hmm. me. Mm-hmm. And then also I think we are animals as humans. And I think sometimes like in our most troubled times, like we feel at our most animal. Mm-hmm. And I think like something about being human involves like sort of denying Mm -hmm. the animal aspects Mm -hmm. of our nature. Mm -hmm. Right. But like they're there. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so like it feels like there's something, um, there's something, I don't know, authentic Mm -hmm. or real about just like Mm -hmm. making explicit, like that's, that's what we are, you know? Yeah. And it makes me think, I mean, the title of the story that you read from is I Buffalo. And there's this moment near the end where she comes to kind of fully feel as if she is one of these buffaloes mm-hmm. from Golden Gate Park and that and it 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 yeah it feels in that way like a a kind of um she's no longer doing that work of like denying this the sort of animal self or the mm-hmm. you know she's sort of owning that she's in this moment of vulnerability and mortification and hunger and yeah. um and I love that about thinking about sort of our our porousness as human beings and um, thinking about in a way like some of those bodily secretions as concrete manifestations of the way that like, of course we're always curating ourselves and thinking, okay, this is the version of myself that I'm putting into the world. or This is the version of myself that I'm choosing to give you in conversation, but there's always so many other parts of us that are getting conveyed that we're not conscious of or not choosing and you know the kind of sweat and sloughed sloughed off skin that we leave behind feels like yes all the parts of us that we're not necessarily volitionally putting out into the world but are putting out into the world yeah. all the time and yeah. to other people all the time um I want this is like one of my very favorite parts of this collection is how it treats what you were just speaking about, like the kind of not only the fracturing of connection, but the kind of rebuilding these like fragile moments and often unexpected and freshly realized and beautifully tender moments of kind of like rebuilding connections. And um, I wanted to ask you to read one more, just this paragraph that, as you know, I'm really obsessed with um, that has to do with sandals and sneakers but also has to do with human connection um would you read it and then and then I'll ask you a couple things about it yes well he and I have been talking about this passage for the past 24 hours over on Twitter so (laughs) um 
Okay, I don't think this needs any context. I hate to suggest that a characteristic is the exclusive domain of one particular sex, but I believe women experience life more communally than men do. We arrive at the answers to life's questions together. Maybe it's because we have higher levels of oxytocin, the bonding hormone. When one, when one woman asks another before heading out for a walk together, should I wear sandals or sneakers? The second recognizes it as a legitimate question, one meant to integrate both women's consciousnesses in figuring out an answer. But when I ask my husband a question like this, he'll respond, I mean, wear sneakers if you think sneakers make more sense, wear sandals if you want to wear sandals. If I press him, asking, for example, well, what kind of shoes are you wearing? He'll answer, but we'll add that his own decision should have no bearing on mine. <laughs> Pure brilliance. This is like <laughs> all I look to literature for is like <laughs> moments such as this. Um, we did, d we integrated we, consciousnesses we, yes. in deciding to both we wear sneakers. We settled on the sneakers communally. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I think my questions about this um, beyond just like, oh, thank you. Um, and these, yeah, the, um, we have, I think you all got note cards and um Many of you have already submitted some questions, but if you have more questions, I think they'll be collecting sort of throughout the rest of the event, so feel free to write them down, um, and we'll be turning to them very soon. Um, yeah, I think beyond just like a, more of this, please, or whatever, I think I, I wonder how you arrive at these um, moments of articulating or locating um, kind of these unexpected but profound sites of connection. So like, yes, there's something funny and tender and true about like the desire to integrate consciousnesses by mm -hmm. talking about what sort of shoes to wear. But I think in a deep way, the collection is actually interested in like, how do the question of like, how do we do this work with other people like in ways both small and large. And so I, I would love to hear you just talk a little bit about how you, um, how you imagined and wrote moments of connection big and small in these stories. Yeah. Um, I wish I had like a very precise answer to that question. I will say, I think it originates probably in the fact that I tend to be Zadie Smith says this thing in this essay, I forget the name of Fail Better. Do you know that essay by Zadie Smith? Mm -hmm. um, she has this essay that like tries to articulate what it means to be successful as a writer, sort of like outside of the, the mm -hmm. kind of like external ways that you define that, like how you decide as a writer that you have been successful. And the definition she comes up with has something to do with like articulating your own particular consciousness on the page, right? Mm -hmm. So like all of us have different ways of like mm -hmm. just existing in the mm -hmm. world or talking or moving ourselves or whatever. And so like the ex to the extent that you can like mm -hmm. put that into words on a page, like you've done a good job as a writer, right? Which I bring up because I think the fact that I'm that I'm interested in like writing about connections between people and among people and like this idea of integrating consciousness I think maybe comes more fundamentally from just like having been born as a person who like, I just like, I, I think I really crave connection with other people, mm -hmm. you know, like mm -hmm. I really, um, that's important to me. Like when I think about the things that like fulfill, fulfill me as a human in the world, it often has to do with like the specifics of like my close family relationships, my close friendships, like being in community, being mm -hmm. in fellowship. Right. Um, and so and I think sometimes like traditionally maybe in like a sort of like American or Northern European context, like when we talk about character in literature, like we tend to like locate the individual as like sort of like in this bubble, right? Mm -hmm. Like you're when we teach it to students even, we're like, what does that person look like? Mm -hmm. What is their personality? Yeah. Like all these things that are sort of like internal to that person mm -hmm. and have nothing to do necessarily with how right. they relate to the outside world. Um I, there's a writer I admire, the essayist Angelique Stevens, who talks about, she, I, I sort of, I read something she wrote in which she describes teaching, as a teacher, teaching character in such a way that um, she tells students, when you think about character, think about like who that person's parents were, who that person's mm -hmm. grandparents were, who that, that person's ancestors like mm -hmm. 500 years ago mm -hmm. were, right? Um, who that person's community is, what the community thinks of that person, how they would describe that person, right? Um, and I think um, for me, just as a human, like that's a way in which I think about who we are more than like thinking about people in isolation. And so I think like 
I become interested because of that in like describing that on the page. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. No, that's that's beautiful, and it it is um, it is such an interesting um, kind of. Ca- just like a a profound connection to draw between a way of being in the world or understanding even what identity is and then a translation into certain craft practices that are like, yeah, what if we did reevaluate those kinds of questions we tend to ask about character, which are often located in the individual Mm -hmm. and reframe them towards like, yeah, what, what are, what are the interactions this person has had in the last hour? And like, who were they in each of those interactions? And where does that desire what is it a desire for and that desire to talk about what kind of shoes you're going to wear? It's almost like a way of saying, let's be in this experience together. And even the same experience could feel a very different way if you've sort of decided to wear a certain shared article of clothing as you're like engaging in it or embarking on it. Yes. Which is, of course, the work we're always doing in conversation or in walking or in anything. Um, And I was thinking too about how like even watching people respond, like when I post that passage on social media, just like everybody being like, oh my God, so right. Or like, oh, like when you're going on a beach walk or just like all these (laughs) moments of just like identification. Um, I wonder how, like I was, uh, there's a phrase I sometimes use in talking to students or thinking about craft that's like, um, I call them weight bearing details, but it's like a detail that, and it's really leans heavily on an understanding of architecture that I don't have. But um, this idea that, you know, like there are certain parts of a house that like are holding up a lot of the weight of yeah. the house and certain details. I think when we read, we realize like, oh, that detail is is almost like um, punching above its weight somehow mm. or just doing a lot of work. And I wonder how those what your um, experience of kind of arriving at those weight bearing moments is like mm. and maybe connected to this is a question about on a broader level, like where stories come from for you? Like, does it, do you, do you kind of imagine a moment to your point about relationality? Like, do you tend to imagine a moment between, between two people as a sort of origin of a story? Do you, do you start with a kind of scene or situation? Do you come with like a crisis in mind and sort of write from there? Like, I imagine it's different with every story, but like, if you could tell us a little bit about like maybe the origin stories of a few of these, like where they began and how you sort of followed the seed of that beginning. Totally. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you hear this from nonfiction students, but I often hear from nonfiction students who know that I also write fiction, like, oh, I can never write fiction. Like I can't imagine that well. Like I have to, I have to write from my experience. And I always sort of like, I always laugh when they say that. And I'm like, you could totally be a fiction writer because um, as any of us who are fiction writers as well as nonfiction writers or just fiction Mm -hmm. writers know, like so much of fiction comes from our own experience. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, like calling it fiction is the thing that allows us to be, to tell the truth, right? Yeah, Um, yeah, yeah. um, And so I'm like looking at these stories. in general, with like every story in here, there's some aspect of the story that comes from like a germ of, like that comes from something that I experienced Mm -hmm. or that somebody I know experienced, right? Um, But then I tend to, I think like, I mean, I don't think it's bad to say that there was this one time in grad school when I drank too much and vomited in my house and didn't know where it was for a minute. Right. For like a second. It you happens know? to everyone. Wahini. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it does not happen to everyone. Happened to me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so, and I started the story in graduate school. Um, and, um, and actually the first version of the story of that story was a story in which like that's one thing that happens in like this woman's ruined life like it's just one moment and i had a class with the writer edward carey mm-hmm. um who i was in workshop with him who's like a very um a writer who like i think sort of like tends to like take things to their most uncomfortable mm-hmm. place sometimes or like their weirdest most surreal place and i remember him saying um like you should take that vomit thing and just make that the story. Huh. Um, and as I revi- I revise, I tend to revise over a long period. And as I revise the story over like 10 years or whatever it was, I um, like, I just kept dialing that up. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I feel like often that's what it is for me. I like start somewhere and then it's like a dialing up of yeah. the thing that's like most intense or most, most real feeling, you know, most uncomfortable and just like going deeply to that place. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, it's so um, it it 
it's really beautiful to hear you talk about following discomfort because I just I believe that so much dwells there in discomfort and and I definitely have um a little bit more that I want to ask you about the relationship between fiction and nonfiction mm. in your life which is as you know something I'm really fascinated by but um I wonder yeah just riffing off of what you just said I am curious to hear a little bit more about your revision process I mean even mm. just hearing like 10 years for that story is yeah. a is a is a wonderfully I mean I don't know if it always felt wonderful but to me there's a lot of awe and like there's a wonderfully long kind of richness in letting a story continue to deepen and evolve over that period of time I wonder if you could speak a little bit to again knowing I'm sure it's different story by story but just yeah what revision looks like for you like both process wise like you know how how it involves bringing in other people readers how those readers sort of see things in a story that maybe you didn't quite see or see things a slightly different way yeah. and then yeah what whether there are patterns you notice in terms of like what revision tends to draw out in a story what you love about it what's difficult about it totally yeah I love I love revision mm -hmm. and I love talking about revision um I started the stories in this collection like between I want to say I mean the most recent one was that story the hormone hypothesis which I started last year but a lot of the stories I started in like 2008 2009 mm -hmm. 2010 when I was in graduate school and then revised over like 10 to whatever it is 10 to 14 years um and the interesting thing about those long revision processes, like most of the stories in this collection, I would say I worked on for at least 10 years. Yeah. Um, and the interesting thing is that you change, right? Mm -hmm. Like our identity is communal, like we were saying earlier, but it's also not fixed in time, yeah. right? Like I'm not the same person as I was, you know, when I was in my late twenties starting some of these stories. Um, so an example of that is the story in here called you are not alone, which um, for those who don't know the story is about an eight-year-old girl whose mom has had a kind of mental health crisis and she has mm. gone to Florida to visit her dad and like meet her dad's new partner and um, who is, she's never met before. Um, and in that story, that story started out as being like a story about this girl and her experience of like isolation and disconnection and like the way in which like she sort of feels like she's on the outside of herself looking in um, and feeling very separate from everybody around her who, who she's supposed to be close with. Um, and for a long time, like that's where the story began. That's where the story ended. Um, and at some point about 10 years in, well, at some point about, I don't know. Yeah. About 10 years in or eight years in or something, I became a parent and mm -hmm. now I have an eight year old. And so there was a period of revision from the time when like my kid was zero to mm -hmm. five or six when um, I suddenly became interested in a way that I never had been interested before in the experience experiences of that character, that mm -hmm. eight-year-old girl's father and stepmother, right? Who in the earlier mm. drafts of the book were like these characters who just like mm. the girl had no understanding of who they were mm -hmm. and was very it just felt very isolated from them. You as a reader didn't really know who they are. And without like giving away details about how the story ends, like in the final version of the story, the story ends up in a place where you became, become like you, you come to understand something more of mm -hmm. the father's perspective and that mm -hmm. stepmother's perspective. And I don't think, it would have even occurred to me to go there in the story mm -hmm. if I had like started and finished the story mm -hmm. when I was 27, you mm -hmm. know? Um, and I'm sure the same is true of like so a story I start now. I think if I work on that story until I'm 55, like I think it'll be a better, yeah. it'll be a better story. But then there's this other layer where it's like when I was very conscious when I was editing these stories of like also not wanting to transform them so that they all read as if they were written by like the 41 year old mm -hmm. version of myself. Mm -hmm. I wanted to preserve something too of like that 27 year old mm -hmm. who wrote some of mm -hmm. the story who originally mm -hmm. drafted the stories. Mm -hmm. I love that. I'm, I'm like, I'm, I'm hanging on every word <laughs> of this like description of revision because it's so, it feels so full of um, so many layers of truth. And I could really, when you, when you say that, that desire to, kind of retain some of that younger self, but also these ways in which like the wisdom of a, just a changed or durational self also enters the stories. It just feels so true because I think there's, there's both, um, there's a kind of, um, um, 
a misbehavior or a mess making or a, the, the mistakes are made mm-hmm. in these stories. You yeah. know, messes are made and people don't always do the right thing and people um, people have kind of sharp edges and they, you know, there's, there's, there doesn't, it doesn't feel like there's um, a kind of guiding uh, imperative of respectability that's sort of mm-hmm. keeping people cloistered. I, I'm think, thinking maybe about this like also really insightful essay you wrote that touched on the idea of respectability when you wrote about Jhumpa Lahiri's sort of influence and your relationship to her work and uh, the ways in which your work is, is pursuing some different projects. Um, but thinking about, yeah, the, the, the mess makers in these stories, but also the, I think the deep maturity in these stories that does come from the way that often the perspective of the story where you've been seeing something over one character's shoulder and then the story lets you see how these other characters are having their own kind of surprising and complex experiences of the same interactions. Um, So beautiful to hear about that. And um, I'm going to turn in a moment. We have some great questions from the audience, um, but I'm going to let myself ask you one more, which is touching on... um, the relationship between nonfiction and fiction mm. in your life. So you have a whole life and career as a reporter um, who's thought a lot about and practiced a lot of journalism. And uh, you've also written um, uh, some beautiful essays. And I wonder how the sort of your fiction writing practice and your various nonfiction writing practices sort of speak to each other. What are the ways in which they feel distinct in what in what you're trying to do when you write in those different forms? And also maybe what are the forms of cross-pollination that have happened between um, what what who you've become as a as a journalist and, and who you are as a fiction writer? Yeah. So for context, so people know I have this um I have this email thread I started with um, <laughs> Leslie and two other writers I really respect and admire who are both um, creative nonfiction writers um, and journalists um, because I find I have relatively recently started writing like what we call creative nonfiction, like sort of um, nonfiction that that isn't necessarily journalistic, that uses some of the techniques of um, of literature. Um, and I have like, I feel like I'm, oh, I, I think, I think I always like, like any of us, I know this is true of you also, Leslie, like I always want to be doing something new, I mm-hmm. think, you know, mm-hmm. like I, mm-hmm. if I've done something once, like I don't want my next project mm-hmm. to be the same thing, not in like a sort of, not with respect to like the publishing market or anything like that, but just like as a person, I always like, I want to be trying something new. And so I think, um, I think writing in different genres is like one of the ways in which I can like figure out like how language can be used yeah. in like new ways that yeah. I haven't tried before. Yeah, you yeah, know? yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I, I also find, I find fiction to be like, to be honest with you, as I was saying earlier, like a really nice, envelope for like those things that you do want to write about that like feel very personal, yeah. but that you don't want to be like talking about publicly, right, you know, right, as right. like things that you've experienced in your own personal life. Right. Like I think like putting, we all, all any, until fiction somebody writer, asks you questions on a stage at the New York public right. library about them. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. Until you admit, <laughs> you, until you talk publicly in front of, in, you know, an audience of however many, but the time you vomited in graduate school. Right. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so I find fiction to be, like, comforting in that sense. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. And I find personal, you know, like, I still haven't figured out, as you know from the many emails I've sent you asking questions about it, I still haven't figured out, like, I, I'm very experienced in journalism, I'm very experienced in fiction writing, and I'm relatively new to, like, that liminal space mm-hmm, of, like, mm-hmm. creative nonfiction in between that I find find myself really drawn to. Like, there's something, like, even that can be even like more potently truthful feeling because we know that it's factual. I Mm -hmm. mean, not necessarily factual, but we know that it's like Mm -hmm. based in what we're calling the truth. Right. Um, and, and that's like, I think that's scary also. Mm -hmm. Like that's, you Mm -hmm. don't have like the sort of guardrails of like Mm -hmm. this fiction of saying it's fiction. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, I find it like, I, I always want to be like in the same way that my, I always want my characters to like be going to those uncomfortable places. Mm-hmm. I guess I do too as a mm-hmm. writer. Mm-hmm. Maybe at the end we'll have a chance to yeah circle back to that because I am curious like what is ahead or what new oh. forms of terror and discovery yeah. <laughs> lie lie await aw- awaiting you and and us as your eager readers. Um, I'm gonna ask you a couple questions from these lovely folks. Um, and oh my god, and there are even more. Okay. 
Um, uh, what compelled you to write a short story collection as opposed to a novel or novella? Oh, um, I think that form for me really follows function, you know, like, I, and I don't know, it's never, it's usually not explicit for me, like the connection between the, what the thing is that I'm trying to write and like the right thing, the right form um, for it. But I somehow, I find that I just know like whether a piece of writing is supposed to be a story or a novel or something else entirely. Um, and I love the short story. I started that form. I started, that's how I learned to write. Like a lot of people who learn to write in like creative writing workshops, I learned to write as an undergrad um, in college, taking creative writing workshops and like reading a bunch of short stories and learning to write short stories. And that's what I fell in love with. I never thought of myself as a novelist for a long time. I thought, I thought of myself, I, I identified as a, as a short story writer. So it's sort of my first love. Um, and it's hard to publish story collections, you know? So it feels really lucky too, to like get to hold this book and have it be a short story collection and not a novel. Um, it's so, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's so interesting to see these, the, your response and these questions, I think, are all, it feels like everybody's part of the same conversation in this room. I'm, I'm trying to create a little, the little arc, um, arc among them. I know, there's such great ones. Um, is the use of the word salvage consciously nautical in that a ship cannot be salvaged until it is first abandoned? Mm, a beautiful question. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to give you these to keep. They're so beautiful. <laughs> um, so that this, um, the, the title of the collection is the title of one of the stories in the collection called This is Salvaged, which is, um, I don't know if like whoever wrote this question already read the story and is like trying to beautifully set me up, but, um, <laughs> but it's about a guy, an artist um, who decides to try to build a life-sized, uh, I mean, yeah, life-sized uh, um arc according to the Bible's specifications. And, um, and there is a relationship between that arc and like this idea of something being salvaged. So like there is literally a, a kind of nautical connection there. Um, the material of this arc, right. Later being salvaged. Um, but then also the reason I chose it to be the title of the collection in general has something to do, I think with how does Danielle, Danielle puts it better than I can. Um, this like this interest in the aftermath of a breaking point, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Like rather than the break itself. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine, like if you can imagine our lives as like being things that can like be broken apart and then reconstituted something somehow. Right. Or like, or, or if you can imagine the process of living as like just an, just that over and over again. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, that too is like something I was thinking about. Mm -hmm. I love that. Um, how do places affect the narrative of your stories? Were situating your stories in a particular city like San Francisco a conscious decision? Yeah, um, yes, for sure. Uh, so that story, I Buffalo. One one thing that we hadn't talked about, haven't talked about yet about I Buffalo, is that the job that this character has lost is as like a corporate lawyer defending um, sort of like real estate slumlords. Mm -hmm. um, which wasn't coincidental, right? Like this is somebody living in San Francisco um, with a job like that. And I, I imagine her, I mean, you don't have to imagine it like this when you're reading the story, but the way I imagine it as the writer of the story is that I imagine like this character's sort of sense of like moral and spiritual dissolution as being connected with like our broader cultural societal moral and spiritual dissolution. And I think San Francisco, where I lived for a long time, is, like, a really interesting site mm -hmm. to think about that, mm -hmm. you know? Like, mm -hmm. you just, like, I have so many conversations all the time with people who, like, refer offhandedly to San Francisco and say, you know, when I say I used to live there, and they'll be like, oh, I went there vis recently, and it's horrible. Like, so much homelessness, but in a way where they're not actually talking about, like, the plight of people who mm -hmm. just can't afford to live there anymore mm -hmm. and therefore have no choice. It's like, they'll be like so much homelessness. Like I saw a piece of crap on the street, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Or like I saw this guy wandering around and getting too close to my personal space. You know what I mean? Um, which I raise, I, I know it seems unrelated, but I raise it because it feels um, like I wanted that story to be partly about that. Yeah. You know, my novel is like very explicitly 
about capitalism, but like I was interested in like that character's connection, like to that, those broader systems of oppression too. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So that's one example. Yeah. And I think there's that, no, it's a great example and makes me want to ask you 10,000 more questions uh, about the role of, um, yeah, maybe various forms of inequality in the, in the periphery or, or, or front view of these stories. Um, and maybe we'll have some time at the end, but I do think place, place allows, for forms of ambush, like thematic ambush or conceptual ambush or emotional ambush that like aren't, yeah, again, are kind of like unwill encounters that are unwilled by the characters yeah. too, which can be so revealing and, yeah. and kind of gets back to that idea of like what parts of ourselves we choose to present or what parts of ourselves just kind of come up, totally. rise yeah. up in, in relation to what we encounter. Um, these are such great questions. What a great room you guys are. <laughs> um, you're such a brilliant editor. Oh. As well as writer. <laughs> Who said that? <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, do you think of editing and writing as holding multiple truths within yourself? Uh, or do you feel them intersecting in yourself? Oh, my gosh. That's such a cool question. Um, yeah, I mean, we. I feel like there's such an interesting conversation to be had, like, just about editing um, mm -hmm. and, like, the, the potential for artistry in editing, right? Because on the one hand, when I'm editing someone my goal, I want my goal to be, um, to like help that person figure out what it is they were trying to say. Right. Mm -hmm. And like their, their most, their articulation, mm -hmm. like their sort of ideal articulation of it, um, by like asking questions or by saying like, here's a spot where we could use a discussion about your thoughts on X, but without saying like, this is what those sh thoughts should be. Right. So on the one hand, it has nothing to do with me, right? Like on the one hand, I am just, um, I'm just like a kind of like, I don't know the right metaphor, but like my, I, maybe a mirror or something, like something to like reflect to the writer, like what, like sort of a vision of like what they, their mm -hmm. ideal expression would be. Um, so in that sense, it has nothing to do with like my own artistic expression. But then on the other hand, you know, we were talking earlier about oral history mm -hmm. um, and uh, I love that as a forum and I love as a journalist and as, as an editor, I love like doing oral histories. So like I might collect 10,000 words of conversation with someone, right? And then whittling that down to mm -hmm. like a thousand word mm -hmm. document. And then there's this question of like, what it means for me to do that, right? Like to what extent is that document a representation of like that person's consciousness? Right. And to what extent is that, is it actually a representation of mine, right? Like to what extent are there choices embedded in that about like what I think mm -hmm. is interesting about that person's mm -hmm. life, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think it would be disingenuous to say that like all one does as an editor is like, is like bring out somebody else's way of viewing the world, which I think is also like it can be dangerous, right? Like or something that we should be conscious of, right. of as editors too, especially when like, we come from backgrounds different from the people we're editing, which is something I think about. Right, right, right. Yeah, and in a way, that beautiful articulation of like the editor-writer dynamic or the the kind of oral historian dynamic is also feels so connected to me to like how you were talking about intersubjectivity earlier, how mm -hmm. your understanding of like a self, right, is like a porous creature, not yeah. a, a, a self-existing in isolation. Right, um, right. Okay, I'm determined to try to get to everybody's questions. So I, I have clustered some que some related questions together um, so that you can, yeah, maybe speak to them in tandem. Yes. And I think that way we'll be able to get to everything. Um, do you feel that story collections need to be conscious of some unifying theme? Um, is it helpful or just a publisher's creation? So mm. kind of question about the constitution of, collection, of story collections and then related. What was your experience of writing the short story collection, as, assuming simultaneously with your novel? Yeah. What has been the experience of publishing the short story collection after the novel when it feels um, uh, it's like so many do the opposite? Mm, okay. Um, yeah, so I, I can talk about both of those. So I... Um, I have been writing stories for a long time. And so like, like many of us, I'm sure other writers in the room, like at various points in my life, I've had like different versions of a story collection, you know, this one or past this mm -hmm. one in past lives. Um, and, um, and 
it was always for a long time. It was just like a bunch of stories that I'd written, like the ones I thought were good. Um, and then when my brilliant publisher and Norton and my brilliant editor, Elaine, who may have left already, I don't see her, um, bought this book, or sorry, bought my novel. They bought the short stories as well. And there was a conversation at one point about like which one to publish first. And I don't remember that conversation. I don't remember like why it was decided to mm -hmm. publish the novel first and the stories next. I did sort of like, I were, was sort of writing them simultaneously. And so I feel like there's this impression that this is like, because it came out second, that like, this is sort of like, sort of like a, a manifestation of a later version of me as a writer, mm -hmm. but in some ways it isn't, you know? Um, so that's interesting. But what I did do as I was about like a, a couple of years or no, a year and a half or something before this book came out was that I like made a list of all the stories and then mm -hmm. I made like, like a grid, like an Excel spreadsheet almost, but I wrote it down where I had like the names of the stories in the left-hand column. And then, and then these, and then these, sorry, these rows sort of in the next columns I had, for example, like, like the names of kind of things I was interested in. Mm -hmm. And one of them was like this thing about like interconnected identity, right? Mm -hmm. Like communal identity. Another had to do with sort of like spirituality mm -hmm. slash religion. Another had to do with, with capitalism. Mm -hmm. um, and I had, so I think I, like I had these different like words at mm -hmm. the top and then sort of like wrote down for myself how each of the stories mm -hmm. connected to those. And then if I didn't, I like, made myself think about what the connection might mm -hmm. be. And through that process, I realized that like there were stories I thought should go in the collection that didn't need to be there. Mm -hmm. And then there were other stories <laughs> where like I could, once I identified the connection to one of the themes, I could sort of like press into it a mm -hmm. little bit more. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's how I went about it. Amazing. <laughs> I love it. There's, um, Sometimes I joke with my students that I'm going to teach a seminar called Executive Function because I like <laughs> think of myself as like the least bohemian writer ever. But if I do, I'm going to have call you in as a guest speaker Amazing. so you can talk about your Excel spreadsheet. <laughs> oh, incredible. Um, okay. Uh, there are three questions that are sort of – they're connected to something I asked you about earlier, but I think there's a lot of interest in the room to hear you speak about it. Right. Um, so I'm going to ask you these together, um, and, and you can you – can, uh, speak to, to some or all of their angles. Um, you have such range in your writing, fiction, journalism, short stories. Uh, what do you use different forms to explore? When do you use what? Um, as a journalist, what drew you to the idea of writing fiction? Um, and yes, I think those are the two about, yeah, yeah. about kind of different forms and genres. Okay, yeah, no, totally. Uh, okay. So, um, I, I love journalism for the way in which, like, I think, I think I tend to be drawn to journalism as like the vehicle for something when I feel like there's like literally something happening in the world that like isn't widely known about, mm -hmm. right? Like maybe people within a little subculture know about it, or maybe I'm writing something somewhat investigative and like people don't know about it because a company has like tried to keep it unknown. Right. Um, and so when that's the case, um, often there's some personal reason that I'm writing the piece, but like the, the kind of, I, the kind of, um, like I'm not the important character, right. Mm -hmm. In the story. So I'm just sort of using my words mm -hmm. to illuminate what's happening involving others. Um, uh, there are limits, I think, to what, journalism can say about the real world. And one interesting limit, I think, um, it applies more to my novel, I think, than to this book. But one interesting limit is that like we tend not to, there are sort of like emerging experimental forms of journalism that sort of like speculate about what's going to happen in the future. But we tend to be really careful about that because we don't want to be putting falsehoods into the world or like things that can't be verified aren't verifiable. And so like when I was, I started as, as started out as a tech reporter. And when I was a tech reporter, like, writing about tech companies in the early 2000s. And we were all, all of us, me and my colleagues, were sort of like seeing, able to imagine like what a future might look like in which these tech companies grew wealthier and more powerful. Like there wasn't a way within reporting that it felt like we could talk about that. And I think that's why, without yeah. meaning to, when I wrote my novel, The Immortal King Rao, which is like about technology in a kind of dystopian future world, I gravitated toward like, describing a fictional future world in which some of these things might come to pass that like 
came from my instincts and my reporting as a journalist, but like I couldn't fit into that mm -hmm. journalism mm -hmm. bucket. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So interesting. And, um, yeah. And, and I could, I could talk to you, I could hold you hostage on this stage and talk to you for hours. And um, we, I, we're, we're I, I think we need to wrap it up, but what I would say for the few last questions that I wasn't able to get to, I would encourage you maybe to, to come to the signing line and ask your questions there. And um, there are uh, books available to buy for everybody who doesn't already have this book. Please buy it. It's so fantastic. It's amazing. And then you can come up here, I think, is where Wahine's going to be signing. So get your book. Come get it signed. And uh, thank you all for and coming. And do me a favor. And even if I know you, write the name in yeah. there of like who I should sign it to because I have this nightmare of like forgetting someone's name all of a sudden, even if you're like my best friend. So <laughs> please write a name in there. And thank you all for being here. Thank you, Leslie. That yeah, was amazing. Thank you. It was so fun to talk. Thank <laughs> you.